the Fort Wayne Central Labor Council, uh, one of the things, it was interesting, I spent a day there, and um, what Tom was telling me was a both, about both their successes and failures. And I want to mention both because it's very interesting. Um, what they're focusing on is to fight it out with the <coughs> government, this, particularly the state government, and focus publicly on the use of public monies and to basically jam elected officials, whether they're Republican or Democrat, but in Indiana you have a lot of Republicans, and you <coughs> jam them about the way public money is used in terms of whether it's uh, tax cuts or whether it's uh, incentives or whatever, but the argument of the Central Labor Council <coughs> is show us the jobs, what's being produced, what kind of jobs, how is this actually gonna have an impact on our community? So that people understand that the Central Labor Council is fighting on behalf of economic development. And they're also not just fighting for the construction of that baseball stadium with the, the, the boxes, the sky boxes, that none of us are ever gonna sit in in our lives. So they're talking about fighting for real um, jobs that help to elevate the community. I asked Tom, I said, well, but what about organizing unemployed people? And one of the things that he said to me was that it was damn difficult. And the gentleman that was um, spoke, uh, speaking from the unemployed uh, committee might want to talk some more about this, but he said it was damn difficult. Because part of what they found was that there was a lot of fear, um, a lot of insecurity, uh, and a lot of turnover. Um, and the fear and the insecurity was uh, in part related to, in many cases, people that had actually never suffered very significant unemployment, whose lives were completely turned upside down, mm -hmm. and they had lost their self-confidence. And they actually didn't think that they could fight, in part because they tend, as anyone who's ever been unemployed knows, no matter what you say, the silent impulse is to blame yourself. Yes. Right? Wasn't there something else I could have done to preserve my job? And so part of what Tom said was that uh, part of the work of the council is to give people support and to encourage them and point out to them that they can be speaking for themselves, but also that they have allies out there. Um, the issue of turnover is a very difficult one, and anyone that's read any of the history of the 1930s and unemployment councils you see, it's not a new problem. That people get into unemployment work not because they're ideologically driven, but because they want a job and they want services. And if they get a job, they're generally not gonna stay with the council or the committee. And so you've gotta build that into the thinking of the organization so that you're not feeling depressed when you don't see people there, but also the question of if you want a longer lasting organization or continuity, it's gotta be more than just a fight for jobs. It's gotta essentially build some level of community. Um, in terms of this issue that you were raising about the decisions on the part of people not to fight, part of what I'd say is that there's two phenomena that we've gotta to come to grips with. One is a kind of NGOization of action of activity and organizing, non-governmental organizations. And the other has to do with the response of most of the liberal and progressive community to the election of Obama. So to the first point, um, I really started thinking about this actually when I was talking with some people in the Palestinian movement about what's happened to the Palestinian movement and the, um, the growth of Hamas and what happened to a lot of the the more secular and left-leaning groups. And part of what happened was many of them were replaced by <coughs> NGOs uh, that the NGO world developed and people's political activity became their job. And they wouldn't do political activity unless they were getting paid. <laughs> um, and I don't mean that they were mercenaries. I don't mean it like that at all. It's just that they associated political activity with a job and, and, and vice versa as opposed to that this, as opposed to what the earlier Palestinian movement was like. And I think in the United States, we've seen a lot of that too. The growth of 
many of these nonprofits that fund and sustain people, but you're often, and I don't want to attack them because we need these organizations, but we've got to be real that the funding world will often determine your priorities. Um, and if they say to you, we're no longer interested in focusing on, on HIV AIDS, mm -hmm. but we now are interested in fighting uh, in green jobs, and ain't no money left in HIV AIDS, it's very difficult for many organizations to say, well, the hell with you, we're still gonna do it unless mm -hmm. they have another income source. So that's affected things, but the Obama issue is something that we've got to speak very frankly about. And as someone who was a critical supporter of Obama, um, that is, I had criticisms before he ran, when he ran, and after he won, um, the thing I would say is that most of the movement gave him a pass. And we're paying the price. And we started to pay the price almost immediately with the growth of the Tea Party movement, which I would argue we could have preempted had, for example, uh, immediately after the election, and certainly after the inauguration, if there had been a march for jobs, if there had been marches around the country for jobs, I think that we could have weakened the impact if not preempted the Tea Party. But people sat back and basically said, we're not going to do this, we're not gonna embarrass him. And in black <coughs> America, you can't, it's very hard to criticize Obama. You have to take a blood test, <laughs> then you have to be wired or, you know, uh, you know, what do they call polygraph. And then after you've passed that, and someone has looked you up and down, then maybe there can be a criticism. But in terms of publicly, people will not do it, <coughs> even though privately there's many people that have criticisms. And part of this, white leftists don't really get. I'm not justifying it, but I really want to say we've got to understand that when you have people like the Bertha movement and the Tea Party movement that are so incredibly racist, there's a reluctance to push back. But the problem is in not pushing back, we've ended up strengthening the other side. And I think that that also has led us to this dilemma that we're in, which we may be turning around uh, uh, right now. 